Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us for this book launch and discussion of Hannah Lucas's new book, Sensing the Sacred, Recovering a Mystagogical Vision of Knowledge and Salvation. My name is Alex Fogelman, and I direct the Catechesis Institute, which is hosting today's event. Catechesis Institute is a research and teaching center dedicated to retrieving classical models of church-based theological education for re the retrieval of the church today. You can learn more about our work at catechesisrenewal.com, and the best way to uh, stay in touch with us is through signing up for our uh, newsletter. Uh, we sponsor a number of events, uh, learning opportunities, gatherings like this, uh, and we also support the work of our research and teaching and pastoral fellows, uh, among whom I'm very proud to say is the star of today's show, Dr. Hannah Lucas. Uh, in addition to serving as a research fellow with the Catechesis Institute, Hannah also lectures at Durham University, where she did her doctoral studies and is a tutor in theology, ethics, and church history at College of the Resurrection. And she's also an editor for the journal Koinonia, which is a journal of the Anglican and Eastern Churches Association. Originally from Western Canada, Hannah now lives in Darlington, UK, with her husband, David, who's a priest in the Church of England, and their four children. Uh, Hannah's book, Sensing the Sacred, is... I have to say, the kind of book I'm just a little bit jealous of. Uh, she reads the Church Fathers with a marvelous perception of their theological depth uh, and also has a keen eye towards how they can offer, as she puts it, a balm for the incapacitations of modern epistemologies. And to give you just a bit of a taste of uh, what that's like. I, I just wanted to read a short passage from uh, her book where she summarizes uh, what she means by a mystagogical pedagogy. It's one that she writes, which is truly integrated because it grounds earthly learning in the whole created order within the transcendent providential reality of salvation in the integrity of one divine act that traverses and gathers the creaturely and the heavenly, the particular and the universal in the comprehensive grace of creation, salvation, and divinization. Such knowledge, she writes, is sensitive to the comprehensive integrity that suffuses the ordinary and leads toward the sublime. So it is indeed an exceptionally rich book and to help us explore some of its riches, we're delighted to be joined by Reverend Dr. Simon Oliver and Reverend Dr. Ephraim Radner to offer some comments and questions for Hannah. Uh, professor Oliver is the Van Mildert Professor of Divinity at Durham University and is author of several books on Christian theology and metaphysics, especially on topics related to the doctrine of creation. Uh, I'd especially recommend his 2017 book, Creation, A Guide for the Perplexed, which is a superb introduction for whether you find yourself perplexed or not. Uh, Simon's also an Anglican priest and currently serves as residentiary canon of Durham Cathedral. And he also, as it happens, oversaw Hannah's doctoral thesis and wrote the foreword for the book. So he, he knows the book quite well. Uh, Dr. Radner is Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology at Wycliffe College in Toronto. He's also very involved uh, with the Anglican Communion. He's written numerous books on numerous topics in Christian theology, uh, but especially on issues related to uh, epistemology or to, to ecclesiology and the theological ground accounts of scripture and its interpretation. And I'll just mention uh, his forthcoming book, Mortal Gods, Mortal Goods, excuse me, Reimagining Christian Political Duty, which is due out in March, I believe, with Baker Academic. Um, so Simon Ephraim, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and contributions to this discussion. Um, I want to also thank, uh, say thanks to the Durham Center for Catholic Studies for helping us spread the word about today's event. 
Um, also to the publisher, Wittfenstock, uh, who not only published the book, but is offering a cool 40% discount on the book for attendees today. And uh, that I'll just, I'll go ahead and reveal, uh, unveil the hidden uh, code. And that is, uh, it is catechesis, uh, C-A-T-E-C-H-E-S-I-S. Uh, and I believe that's good until April. And that's through Whip and Stock. So I'll, I'll put this in the chat um, in time to come. But for now, I just wanted to say uh, a, a special thanks to, to those groups. Um, just a brief word about the format. Um, uh, Hannah will will speak first, and she'll she'll um, tell us a bit about the book and uh, what she's uh, attempted to do here. And then we'll hear from Simon and Ephraim after that. Um, and then Hannah will have some time to respond to those. And then we'll also have a little bit of time, I believe, at the end for some general Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, you can be thinking of those as we go along, and you can either um, put those in the chat or use the, the hand raise feature, but uh, we'll come to that in due time. Uh, so I think that's all I need to say for now. Uh, but just let me say again, thank you so much for joining us. We're all uh, so delighted you're here to discuss this important book. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How does my audio sound? Okay, crisp and clear, loud and clear <laughs> as I cough into the microphone. So I apologize for any sniffling and coughing as we had COVID again over Christmas. So but hopefully that won't be too disruptive and irritating. Um, so thank you so very much, Alex, for the introduction and for hosting this event on behalf of the Catechesis Institute. Um, I'm so excited and grateful to everybody who has Zoomed in today on purpose to nerd out about mystagogy for an hour-ish in your day. Um, <clears throat> so, <coughs> pardon me. So, um, Sensing the Sacred is a theological exploration of knowledge. So it's a theological epistemology. Um, and it goes about that exploration and the construction of a picture of knowing in conversation with a particular genre of texts from the early, uh, the early church. Uh, and these are the mystagogies. So first, what is mystagogy? So Mystagogy is a, a subset of catechesis, and it deals with the mysteries, hence mystagogy, i.e. the sacraments. So it was associated tightly with the process of initiation in the early church. So in addition to the kind of catechesis that many of us will be familiar with that instructs regarding the scriptures or walks through the creed, uh, mystagogy often happens after initiation and it walked through the liturgy, specifically the liturgy of baptism and the Eucharist. All right, so my traveling companions and guides in the pursuit of a liturgical epistemology are the fourth century mystagogues who are Ambrose of Milan, Cyril of Jerusalem, John Chrysostom and Theodore of Mopsuestia. Pardon me. <coughs> Sorry, everybody. So the book opens um, by quoting from um, what is called Jesus' high priestly prayer that you find in John 17, where Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Um, and I say in the introduction that the argument that I offer is more than anything a contemplation on the subjunctive clause in that prayer, the, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this book is about our capacity and our capacitation for that knowledge. And it's particularly interested in how the order of creation the order of the human intellect uh, are coherently drawn into this grace of 
what I'm calling capacitation for the knowledge of God that is eternal life. Um, and spoiler, that knowledge in the end becomes kind of indistinguishable from simply union with God. Um, but let me say something about this word capacitation. So I encountered this word in and have borrowed it from David Fagerberg, um, who's a Catholic theologian um, at Notre Dame. But going back a bit, the, the word capacitation is perhaps a neologism, um, but the idea of thinking through knowledge and sacraments in terms of our being capacitated for union with God is there in the mystagogues. Uh, somewhat implicitly and in Cyril of Jerusalem explicitly. And there are some important moments in the mystagogies where it comes to the surface. Just a sec, <laughs> sorry. So the, the paradigmatic place where capacitation explicitly appears is in Cyril of Jerusalem's mystagogy. And I take his, his imagery and this language and run with it. Um, and this becomes kind of the accompanying key to the whole work. So Cyril says, as he embarks on his mystagogical instruction, that he has longed to teach these things. And he says to the neophytes who have passed through initiation, you have been made fit to receive the more sacred mysteries, having been counted worthy of divine and life-giving baptism. So, and here Cyril uses the Greek word koretikos, meaning capable of receiving or capacitated and this word is related to the word kora, meaning space and place, like a, a vessel capable of containing something. And what is that something? Cyril says, you were made fit to receive the most sacred mysteries. And these are the mysteries of union with God. So I expand the phrase a bit in reference to other patristic writers as koretikos theu, so capacitated for or capacitated toward God, toward bearing and communion with God. So the book takes this idea of koretikos, being made fit to receive divine mystery or made fit to receive God himself as its central theme. And um, it asks how the liturgical capacitation for union with God in the sacraments analogizes and illuminates and makes sense of epistemology, of human knowledge. And even more broadly, I begin to suggest throughout all the chapters that koretikos theu, capacity for God, gives us an indispensable insight into metaphysics, into creation as a whole, the phenomena of human intellection, the reason why we have bodies, the meaningfulness of materiality. Um, I truly, I like, I can't help myself. I have this intellectual and spiritual attraction to possibly a compulsion towards a kind of theory of everything or the sense of a kind of teleological integrity to reality as a whole. And that being kind of deeply and irrevocably theological and unitive and consummatory so nothing grandiose <laughs> um so so that's the kind of orienting theme of the book and then we walk through the ritual sequence of christian initiation via the mystagogical catechesis of these four church fathers um and we start to build this picture of epistemology so of knowledge as capacitation for union so the first four chapters go on this liturgical journey uh, through specifically the Ephatha rite, which I will explain, um, the renunciation of the devil and the adherence to Christ, baptism itself, and finally the Eucharist. Um, and each of these liturgical moments are paired with a sense or a human faculty that is explored likewise as an analogy for knowing. 
sorry about that. So uh, first, Theophatha right, which appears only in Ambrose and Roman Catholics today will recognize this rite. It's the first component of the baptismal liturgy. And it's where the priest or the bishop touches the ears and the nostrils or the mouth of the baptismal candidate. And in this symbolic recapitulation of Jesus healing of the deaf mute in Mark chapter seven. And he uses Jesus Aramaic word of healing, ifatha, be opened. And so this first chapter thinks about the sacramental opening of the senses, specifically opening the ears to hear and loosing the tongue to speak, following the pattern of that mark in healing and asking what that might mean for human knowing, right? So an openness to divine speech, to the word, and rolling out from the salvific particularity of Christ the word to the cosmos spoken into being by God, creation made by, through, and for Christ the word. So there's a quite a bit of exploration of creation in there, of logos in the cosmos, uh, or as I call it, um, the logosity of being. So chapter two, um, thinks about the renunciation of the devil and adherence to Christ, or the apotaxis and the syntaxis, um, alongside the human capacity for speech. And it takes as a theme, uh, a Greek word that John Chrysostom uses to talk about the bold, free and truthful speech of the baptized. And this word is parisia, and it means free speech, bold speech, frankness, um, and here I think about the renunciatory address to Satan facing the West, um, as Cyril says, the region of darkness. Uh, and I read that further as the renunciation of dissemblance and dissonance. And then the liturgical turn to the East, to the sunrise, to the place of light, uh, and the speech of adherence to Christ that the candidates make with their voices with their bodies in consonance and agreement with the prevenient language of the cosmos, uh, the logic of sunrise and sunset, darkness and light. Um, and in this chapter, I also draw in Theodore, who at least in the Syriac translation of his mystagogy speaks about the initiated being inducted into heavenly conversation. And so there's an eschatological piece to this liturgical reality and therefore an eschatological piece also to the vision of knowledge that I'm constructing. So chapter three turns to baptism itself uh, and here the themes of light and the faculty of sight are natural as baptism is called in the early church, illumination or enlightenment and the idea of epiphany and manifestation is important here. So I spend some time thinking about the fact that in the early church, candidates were baptized naked. Um, so there's this symbol of being stripped of the, the stain, but also the obfuscation of sin and revealing the truth of our nature. Um, because of grace, Chris Austin says, the illumined see things as they truly are, or they see with exactness. And I expand and explore that further in terms of our knowledge more broadly, knowing things truly and with a sacramental precision. The rite of baptism also includes an anointing with oil, um, robing in a white garment. And I spend some time reading that analogically, um, <clears throat> that the anointing with oil and with the Holy Spirit um, and the brilliant shining robe, as uh, Chrysostom and Theodore say, are not new obfuscations over nature, but are the fulfillment and the consummation of creature and of creation. And here at the tail end of baptism, the mystagogy start to begin hinting at a nuptial reading of initiation, because this baptismal garment is the raiment of the bride of Christ. 
Uh, so these newly adorned baptisms are heading now to the altar to commune with Christ. So this brings us to chapter four, where we get to the Eucharist. And this chapter is paired with touch as everything is moving towards the consummation of the rite of initiation. And as I argue, the consummation of all knowing in intimate union with Christ. And I take as a, a, a thematic phrase, Theodore's instruction that we joyfully embrace him with all our power so that Eucharistic embrace becomes the pattern and the telos of knowledge. And here I give attention to how strongly the mystagogues are drawn to interpret the Eucharist nuptially. It's, it's a really profound and kind of irrevocable um, symbolic key for them. <clears throat> so there's language of consummating the senses and desires and even the search for knowledge in this union with Christ. So I run pretty hard <laughs> with this nuptial imagery. Um, I don't think much harder than the mystagogues, but I run pretty hard with this nuptial imagery as regards all knowing um, and that this kind of nuptial Eucharistic which is also an echo of an eschatological union of love lies beneath the logic of creation and beneath the structure of knowledge, even in the most humble and mundane details. So finally, all that liturgical itinerary and the idea of capacitation traced through those first four chapters, this stands against the kind of impoverished and reductionistic vision of knowledge under which we live and think today, <clears throat> which sees um, knowledge as either the mere accumulation of kind of inert information, or on the other hand, a more kind of postmodern vision of knowledge that problematizes the possibility of encounter between knower and known to such a point that we can no longer speak of knowing at all. And this contrast has a really striking implication if we take seriously my thesis that knowledge maps onto the liturgy, which builds to real union and not to a kind of tyrannical epistemological aloofness. So chapter five is kind of a different discussion it's more of a, a critical and creative deployment of this sacramental epistemology. So this last chapter, uh, chapter five is called A Cure of Pagan Maladies. And um, I stole or borrowed that title from um, Theodoret of Cyrus and an apologetic work that he wrote by the same name. And so Theodoret is, you know, doing the early Christian apologist thing of engaging with the philosophies of his day and arguing for the consummate superiority of faith in Christ. So I likewise undertake an exercise of kind of diagnosing my contemporary context. Theodore, it says that the physician washes the head and casts out the malady to restore harmony to the members of the body. And I take this washing of the head as a metaphor for kind of philosophical criticism. Um, and it's fairly creative what I construct here. It's asking the fourth century mystagogues to dialogue with our late modern approaches to knowledge and creation. So in this chapter, I outline four so-called pagan maladies or patterns of thought that are somewhat dominant in our present context um, which rather than capacitating us to knowledge and union, they incapacitate us. Uh, and then I take elements of the mystagogical teachings um, on the sacraments as an answer to, or a, a corresponding curatio or a cure or a salve for these kinds of wounds of modern epistemology. So this last chapter is, probably the strongest bit that contributes to the book's subtitle, Recovering a Mystagogical Vision, 
of knowledge and salvation. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, but I hope that I have wet everybody's appetite, not really for me and my voice, but for one, um, the voice of the church fathers and two for mystagogy um, as a catechetical discipline. Yes. Um, but also I think more significantly and more beautifully as a way of understanding the cosmos and the capacity and unitive goal um, of knowledge altogether. So thanks everybody. Excellent, thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, a wonderful articulation um, and, a, and a beautiful note to end on as well. And it, and it strikes as something that's really uh, apropos to the, to the Institute, which is about helping us see catechesis as not an isolated thing, but uh, as a deeply integrated to uh, much else in, in theology. Uh, I'll turn it over to Simon now, who's going to offer some comments. And then after that, we'll hear from Ephraim. Simon, thank you. Great. Thank you, Alex. And um, thank you, Hannah, as well. And it's wonderful to be able to talk about this, um, this great book that uh, I know from personal experience is the result of um, several years' extremely hard work. So uh, thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do in just five minutes of comments is underline one or two things that uh, Hannah has said that she's offered for us uh, and, and maybe pose a, a question at the end that we might be interested in discussing later. Um, I think the first thing to say is that having um, accompanied Hannah on this project uh, on these four fourth century mystagogues, um, Ambrose Cyril of Jerusalem, Theodore of Mopsuestia and John Chrysostom, um, they are, of course, the four of them very different, writing in Syriac, Greek and Latin from different regions of the then Christian world. Um, they are united around this idea of initiation into mysteries um, as bishops, as um, catechists. But they are weird. They're really weird. And we should we should um, confront these texts as as very strange for us as late modern people. Um, and, I, and I think if they become overly familiar, we probably fail to understand their power and their importance. So, um, and I think Hannah conveys that strangeness extremely well, and we need to sit with it. So what I'd like to do is um, point to some of that strangeness and, and why it should strike us as odd, why there's a bit of dissonance with the way that we think about catechesis, pedagogy, um, epistemology, understanding, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, three comments I've got. First is, what kind of pedagogy is this in these four mystagogues of the fourth century? Well, in a sense, it's a different kind of empiricism. Now, we're very familiar today with the idea that we want, um, we want evidence, we want data, we want uh, sense, evidence particularly we're used to the idea of the empirical sciences these deliver knowledge these deliver certainty but we understand that kind of empiricism that reliance on our sense experience in a particular kind of way that was formed very powerfully particularly in the 17th century with the rise of the modern natural sciences and the philosophy of rene descartes and as Hannah said, we do tend to treat our experience as bits of data arrayed before us. We see this, we hear that, we observe this over there, we saw that at this time. And we array them uh, as if they were on the dining room table and, and we try and piece it all together after the fact, as it were. And there is this very strong sense that our knowledge understood or gained through our senses represents the world, okay? And that idea of representation is really important. Um, so a common image that we can, we can use is the idea that when we see something, we are witnessing it in our minds as if we were looking at something on a screen. You know, screens are very powerful cultural images and tools for us. We're using one at the moment, right? We're looking at each other on a screen. And there is this tendency, going back to Descartes, to think that our sight, when we look at things in the world, we are in our head looking at the world as if we were observing it on a screen. And the screen in our mind 
represents the world. Now, the problem with that view of re knowledge as representation that actually goes back to the 14th century, is that we're never, we're, uh, two things. Firstly, we're never sure that our representation of the world is trustworthy, yep. Is it a reliable representation? That's the first thing. So we're skeptical about our knowledge. And the second thing is because our knowledge is merely a representation of the world, we stand at a distance from the world. It's as if we're looking at our world on a screen, okay? We're kind of witnessing it at a distance. Um, now, this is absolutely, and, and the primary sense then for us as late modern people is sight, okay? Seeing is believing, right? And we see the world as if it were on a screen. I remember going into Durham Cathedral and celebrating at the Eucharist for the first time after the, the lockdowns and everyone had been used to worshiping on a screen and witnessing as if they were just passive and an, a, a member of an audience. And I stood at the altar and I said, the Lord be with you. And there was no response. There was no response because everyone was just passively looking at me as if I were on a screen. So, but th this is a very important um, sort of image for the way that we think about knowledge, knowledge at a distance. Now, this is not the kind of empiricism that mystagogues are offering, quite the reverse. What Hannah has said is that the mystagogues were, were interested in senses as intimate, connected, immediate, yeah? which is why the primary sense is touch. Okay, so seeing uh, for, for the mystagogues uh, and in the ancient world is much more about our, our immediate conscious presence in the world and our proximity. In fact, sight is often described as a form of touch. Yeah. Um, so you know, the way that they're, the, the pedagogy they're offering is about that kind of intimate knowing, which is why the, the marital nuptial image is so important. Okay, why the, the, the physical bodily proximity, let the oil teach you, touch is important, open the eyes of your mind and your physical eyes, these things are connected, our souls are in the world, they are in the world, when, when we touch things, our souls are touching them, they're not as they were for Descartes, our souls, our minds are not locked in our heads, at some kind of distance and abstraction from the world, uh, when we touch things, uh, our souls are touching them, there is an intimacy, and that is what it is to know things, to have union with them and with God through them. So it's a different kind of, completely different kind of empiricism, a different kind of pedagogy, pedagogy that's really strange. But I think that there's a kind of childlike innocence about it. So when we, when we think about Christian catechesis or, or, or knowledge, we tend to think, rather propositionally, in very abstract terms, do you really grasp the metaphysics of the Trinity? Well, it's not like that for the mystagogues. It's about entering the life of God by becoming ever more intimate with God through our, through our physical intimacy, our body. So that's the first thing. And this is important in terms of catechesis because for the mystagogues, the, the catechetical process happens in and through the liturgy. This is liturgical knowing. And that it really is important for us because we tend to think of catechesis in sort of slightly rationalist terms. Once we've got everything sorted out, we believe the doctrines and the propositions, then we pray. It's not like that for, for the, the mystagogues at all. Um, you only learn what it is to be a Christian and believe in God by praying first. And that you do catechetically led by your bishop. Okay, that's the first comment. The second comment uh, try and be more brief, concerns mystery. Mystery is at the heart of mystagogy. Um, it's, it's there in the title. A mystery is terribly important. For us late moderns, mystery betokens a deficit in understanding. It's something that's got to be overcome. If something is mysterious, it's got to be clarified so that we then understand something, we grasp it and we comprehend it. That is what it is to know something. So mystery is to be overcome, um, and it's, it's negative in that sense. For the mystagogues, the reverse is the case. Mystery is truth because truth is mystery. And what they mean by that is that mystery does not be a token, a deficit, but a surfeit, a surplus of truth, an abundance of light that is God. And um, the mystagogues understand that 
a, the catechesis then is an entry into the deep mystery of God as the infinite fullness of truth that can never finally be comprehended or grasped or laid out as if it were bits of data on a table or controlled and manipulated as much of modern science and technology tries to do. So the mystagogues do not contrast the mystery of God either with the straightforward comprehensibility or graspability of the created world. They're interested in an initiation into both the mystery of God and the mystery of our own being, the mystery of the created order, um, its infinite value and signification as well. Um, and those cannot be um, exhausted. So it's not simply an initiation into uh, into a, a sort of abstract mystery of God contrasted with the world that we can comprehend, understand and control. It is about being um, initiated into the mystery of our own being through oil, water, bread, wine, candles, clothing, touch, embrace, vocal address, um, prostration, leading by the hand, elements of gesture um, becoming signs and bearers of God's grace. So, so that's mystery and we might want to talk a little bit more about mystery in our discussion finally um could i very quickly underline an important part of the mystagogues emphasis on health okay salvation as health now particularly the western tradition has been very focused on uh, when it talks about salvation a whole collage of sacrificial juridical ransom images that we find in uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, first letter to Timothy, Galatians, Hebrews, those images of salvation are very present. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But particularly early church theologians of the East were very concerned with salvation as healing and health. And the etymological connection between salvation and health, salus, is very evident in, and sozo is very evident in both Greek and Latin. And the mystagogues are particularly interested in the healing miracles in the synoptic gospels, which are absolutely central to understanding Christ as physician, Christus Medicus, who in the tradition is also intimately linked to Christ the teacher. So we have Christ the teacher and Christ the healer, who is taken together Christ the saviour. And health understood as healing salvation is very much what the mystagogues are interested in which is a healing both of body and soul, of intellect and will. And this is what the mystagogical rites are really all about and why they have soteriology as a central concern, both healing of, um, of body and intellect. Okay, I've gone on for too long, Alex. Thanks very much indeed. I'll hand over. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon. Ephraim, I'll, I'll go right to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, Hannah, thank you for letting me part of be part of this. This is a real, real privilege. Um, because it's great, uh, written by a great person, substantive. Uh, I found it very persuasive, clearly written, and it sort of shot through at times with an appropriate vein of eloquence and beauty. Um, the writing, the uh, descriptions that I think point deeper realities at stake uh, in your whole project. But I want to say something about the genre and the way your arguments may or may not fit into the genre. So the book, as you've explained it so well, is an exploration of the mystagogical catechesis or teaching of the early fathers. Um, and you're clear up front, nonetheless, that you're not engaging in a simple historical study of this teaching. We choose four writers. I don't know whether they're the weirdest ones or not, but in any case, um, they're meant to be represented, representative rather than uh, providing a systematic uh, terrain. And you do your scholarly and historical homework very well and responsibly, as far as I can tell. But that's not your goal, you say. You say, in fact, that um, you are doing something different. In a way, I would put the book in a direct and worthy lineage to John Keeble's Tract 89 on the mysticism attributed to the fathers. 
Um, and those who know me know that that is high praise indeed. Um, although it's interesting you never mentioned Keeble, even though there are some very substantive and direct overlaps between his large tract and what you're doing. But in any case, what you say you're doing is an exercise in resourceful. And this is the self-consciously 20th century attempt to retrieve patristic theology, most importantly, and then, as it were, to reapply its insights, its fundamental truths to contemporary theological risks. And behind the method, as it were, is the conviction that the early church understood Christian truth in key ways that are simply better, truer than today. And that, as you put it, modern theology is uh, impoverished. Maybe it's even deformed outright to its failure to engage these earlier understandings and practices adequately. So, Sure, small, as you point out, and obviously most people know, is associated with the 20th century movement, especially among Catholic theologians, most famously Henri de Lubac. But it's also behind an entire liturgical form movement from the early and mid 20th century that, in fact, gave rise to some very concretized revised prayer books among Anglicans, Lutherans, and others who but especially baptismal and Eucharistic rites into a kind of conformity um, along with the Catholic Church. But in fact, um, very self-conscious idea and practice of resource small predates its time frame by centuries, not just hands of referring to Keeble in the 19th century. And it's an interesting point that I'll come back to in a second. In any case, resource small has a polemical edge you actually refer to radical orthodoxy as an example, which I think is a telling model of what you're about, though happily, what you provided is more gentle than some radical orthodox projects. Still, your book is unashamedly polemical in this regard. There is a liturgical metaphysic, you argue, in play, the writers you examine, and you want to bring it back into view, largely because of its procurement, the rejection that is lodged, you argue, in the substance of many contemporary ills. And metaphysics, after all, is about the most basic things there are. And thus, the early church of Ambrose and Cyril and so on, uh, as it were, got the basics right about the world and God in a way that today we've forgotten or found detriment. So, one way I look at the book is to read it backwards, as it were from the impoverishment of the present as you present it into the gifts of the past. And as you uh, summarize so well, you end the volume with a pungent contemporary revisioning of uh, Theodore Cyrus's uh, fifth century cure for the maladies of the pagans. In early church mystagogy, you argue, provides a kind of cure for some of today's cultural and intellectual maladies. And these maladies, you explore under the general heading of anesthetization, the dulling or numbing of the senses, particularly of hearing, speaking, seeing, and touching. These are the sensory topics as you explained it by which you structured the book as a whole and, and brought it into some kind of analogy with the created world of, of human physical life and knowing. And the modern self, you say is impoverished, it's empirically denuded, skeptical, it's thrust back to the aimless and isolated subjective self, that confronts a world that is deeply, which is to say metaphysically, understood and experienced as silent, tongue-tied, intrinsically formless, finally coldly mystic, which that Simon just talked about as well. And all the worries theologically about inert matter, creaturely ignorance before the truth, the uh, destructive power of human domination over well, everything, and the need protectively to stand far off from that which we love, but we harm it, all these cultural tendencies have left us bereft, floating in a material cosmos without real purpose or any final joy. That's the, that's the bad part of the present, 
that you're going to work backwards from the cure in a way. And thus, the early church, by contrast, saw as part of the great gift of salvation and the gift of the church's own mission, the education of the senses, if you will, hearing, speaking, seeing, touching, as you explained it, is a divine grace that properly pursued opens up the self and world together in order to know God, live with God in the midst of creation. Mystagogical teaching, the process of catechesis and sacramental life in particular, you argue is all about opening up this, this capacitation of the senses to perceive the world as it really is, made by God, ordered to its fulfillment with God. So, and this is how I'm reading the book. From your perspective, the retrieval you are after is less a retrieval of the fathers, per se, than a retrieval of the created world itself, the world in its true being for and with and from God. Creation, creation speaks of God, to use the, the senses as you lay them out. Um, if we knew how to listen, and humans themselves speak to God in truth, glory and divine beauty are in fact visible in the world. It was made as such. And creation is not simply an unformed layer in which to project mostly twisted desires. And finally, God himself and all of this draws us into his actual real and intimate embrace. That's the nuptial part through it all. It's a participation in and reflection on the sacraments. Um, but that reflection insists that all of this for us in this world is possible. So, you're making a claim about the truth. As you said in your own intro, you're, you're, um, you say you're obsessed with theories about everything, but in any case, a claim about the truth in its most fundamental character, a claim about the truth misapprehended woefully in our own day. So I'm stressing the substantive claim that you're making, because I find it so bracing, I find it obviously challenging, and perhaps even hopeful. But I say only perhaps, perhaps, and perhaps part is tied back to this genre, resource small, at least as it has traveled through the churches and culture's corridors of use. As I said, resource small, even of its particular patristic kind, and even with its liturgical, catechetical focus, is not in fact only a 20th century mode of theological work. There have been several resource small moments, if you will, in church's history. Perhaps the most closely and widely engaged being the 17th century retrieval uh, movement in France, especially, but then in England, Augustinian and patristic writing, worship, and discipline. And it even gave rise to specific interests in renewed and transformed sensory faculties, explorations that eventually led to elaborated theologies of the spiritual senses and their relationship to bodies and pneumatic energies. John Wesley was one of the most famous of these explorers, and he himself had come out of a whole milieu of patristic or small. At the direction he took all of this, the directions were, as we look back today, so shaped by other philosophical and scientific influences of his early modern environment, some have argued Wesley ended up an empiricist behind Hannah, you associate with the lawless, pedagogical citation that characterizes our contemporary era. Something analogous could be said about the Jansenist retrievalists, the people I'm most familiar with, whose Augustine and Chrysostom take on a posture that seems oddly reactive to their own emerging political and economic circumstances. So, all of which is to say, question, resource law is an exercise, perhaps as much or even more about today than the least. It doesn't make it unuseful, illuminating just the opposite, but it raises the question about the present with a special insistence. And even how the putative negative aspects of the present are actually providing a limited set of reactive answers mm -hmm. to their own issues. The question to ask yourself, 
how your answers are reflecting the present and the past you're retrieving. And this is what I'd like to hear more about. Not so much what is wrong with today, how today can in fact be opened up to the truth in a way that escapes the terms as you have already said. So if there's a curacy or a cure, was it really meant to be applied in a way that doesn't replicate problems themselves? I mentioned that in fact, the liturgical resource small of the mid 20th century gave us renewed patristic forms of baptism and Eucharist already. The question is, how did they work out? What was the catechetical, pedagogical effect of any of this? We now have a track record that we can actually examine. And that's the extent to which I have some gnawing doubts. I was, for instance, interested that the scriptural side of the epiphanic character of the world that you explicate through sacramental mystagogy is not, in fact, ended too much in the book. And I'm assuming that's because scriptural learning in our day has so long been appropriated uh, to the more modern information model of pedagogy that it's not helpful. But if scriptural epiphany has lost its edge or traction in our day, how does more sacramental capacitation escape the same fate? Has it not? After all, we have large tracts of ecclesial existence, orthodoxy, aspects of Catholicism, and so on, not to mention Anglican prayer books, that have maintained mystagogical commitments, at least theoretical, theoretically. In fact, there are not a few, though still no more than a few, evangelical Protestants who have been attracted into these more sacramental terrains. Still, is there a proof in the pudding when it comes to the, uh, the ethical, the broad sense of navigating habits within the world, the ethical witness of such traditions. And that's what I'm not certain about. I wait to hear more about this in large part because of the promise you offer of uh, being so penetrating and so alluring. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ephraim. And I'm just anticipating that we are going to go over 11 o'clock. So I understand if people need to drop off, but um, if it's okay with the presenters, we'll, we'll just continue this uh, conversation and people can stay on as uh, however long they'd like. I'd love to give Hannah some time uh, to respond to uh, either or both uh, Simon's or, uh, and or Ephraim's comments um, to reflect on this and continue this rich discussion that, that's already emerging. Um, and then if, if folks want to put a question in the chat or... Um, uh, in due time, do the hand raise feature. You're, you're more than welcome to do that. But Hannah, I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear me now? And there it is. Okay. I was getting error messages. Okay. Um, thank you very, very much, um, Simon and Ephraim. Um, I'm not amazing at holding all the things you brought up in my mind and being able to um, to answer them adequately. But I will make a couple comments, and I I am interested to hear from anybody else in the in the audience. But um, Ephraim, I'm not sure I can answer your last question, but but I would really like to. Um, but I wanted to pick up on. Um, on the hope and the joy that I'm, I'm very thankful that you, you kind of noted and, and honed in on. Um, and I, and, and I really appreciate and love your turn of phrase, how you said that I was attempting to recover, not, not so much the church fathers, maybe even not primarily mystagogy or this kind of the century of mystagogy but was um creation altogether and you were also right to read the book backwards because that's how i experienced the research um was first actually this comes to what simon said first the the dissonance and between the kind of ontological and epistemological baggage I already swim about in 
and the the what I called wounds or the or the the lacks or the dis difficulties and the desensitizations that are there, um, and seeing seeing in these texts a world that I don't belong to, but kind of wish that I did at least conceptually. So so you're right to point out that the the version of resource one I was offering is um is is pretty bold. It's not it's not simply let me let me give us the best critical edition of of some text that's still in Latin or still in Syriac. Um, what I wanted to say about essentially your your question was does this and can this work? I I think um, and I think that that deeper level of discussion that that was happening beneath the sort of exploration of epistemology and liturgy that that I was tracing with the mystagogues, um, it only functions if the sacraments are true. And if, um, I'll be quite frank, if the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is true. And then the kind of sacramental ontology that then um, I was arguing permeates all of creation, that that hinges on that union, on the union of um, the incarnation and the union of divinity and humanity made possible in, in the liturgy. Um, yeah, so in that sense, it is, um, it is, it is imagining with the fathers how how radical is the real presence of Christ? Um, I could um, sort of mumble onwards, not really comprehensively, but I think I'll leave that there. And I know it's not satisfactory, but I'd love to um, continue the conversation. And I wanted to, I'll add, I'll I'll comment just a little bit on on Simon, what you had to say about um, kind of modern empiricist visions of knowledge and the kind of mystagogical vision of knowledge that I was attempting to articulate. And there's kind of a funny irony that I was only really realizing when, when you were talking, because I, each of these chapters tend to take a phrase from, from the mystagogues and just play around with it and have it kind of accompany us and bring us back to the kind of vision of capacitation for, for union and for union with God. And interestingly, in, in the chapter on baptism, that, that word is akriveia, which is a Greek word, meaning that's that exactness or the, that precision. And Chrysostom says the baptized by when grace, de when grace descends, um, one can see things as they really are. And so on the surface, it sounds like the kind of empirical um, the kind of empir empirical and rationalist exactness that the modern project was attempting, right? The, the laying forth of things on the dining room table. And so an exactness would be this kind of encompassing and dissecting um, vision of knowledge. But the, the chapter kind of turns the, capacitation, the capacitation of sight sort of involves this receptive seeing but it turns into kind of a transfigured scene where we become the, the shining vision by participating in Christ, the light. So this kind of fuller, fuller vision of knowledge as, as sight, like I, I see the truth, is not only kind of I observe and I have represented the truth, but it becomes I have beheld the truth in this ordinary bit of creation or in whatever, but I have, I have been, I've beheld God, the author, I've beheld Christ, the logos, Christ, the light, Christ, the, the icon of the invisible God. And in that beholding that, that is not just sort of at a distance, as you were saying, um, that becomes a union that, that makes me kind of 
theophanic in a participative way in the way that God that Christ is revealing um, divine truth and the truth of the Godhead. Um, yeah, and then that way that 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 chapter kind of turns to participation um, in in the light of God and the transfiguration of of that union. I think in in this kind of cheeky <laughs> cheeky ironic way steals that that modern vision of of precision and then that vision of knowledge becomes our becoming a more accurate and precise um copy of christ or in the in the imago dei or the the image of christ um so i'll stop there as well excellent thank you Anna. and there's um uh we probably have time for, for one or two questions here. If someone wants to um, raise a question, there's one question in the chat from Brian um, about, um, to, is this book in discussion about the reintegration of the sacred and secular? Um, so I wonder, Hannah, if you maybe want to take up that, to what extent do you see the book fitting in into, a dis, into that discussion about the reintegration of sacred and secular? Um, particularly as it relates to um, the supreme manifestation of of creation and the love of God in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes. The, the short answer is yes. That question puts, puts it perfectly. And it is to um, kind of challenge the thesis of the secular altogether, right? So it's it's not even really, well, yeah, I guess it is a reintegration, but it is, such a kind of consummate reintegration that we would understand the sacredness of the ordinary and not and not in and of its own sake because the I know that um when people kind of are aware of these kind of like re-enchanting universe discussions you can get a bit worried um about the like well if everything is sacred and magical then nothing is or or then how can the eucharist possibly be that important um but uh the okay christ the son is the image of the father is the perfect image of the father the hypostatic union of divinity and humanity in christ the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which all, in my mind, participate in the same kind of reality. That, that is always primary and underlies the sacredness of the ordinary, the sacredness of the secular, or the, or the kind of encompassing of the secular within the sacred, or the sacralizing. I, okay, I'm making a mess now, but, but, um, yeah, all that is to say that one, yes, it does hinge on the Eucharist because that is that point given to us by Christ and through the tradition of the church, um, whereby um, all ordinary things become can become Eucharistic or nuptial, not, not in replacement of those kind of ecclesiastical structures um yeah okay the thought, the thought has ended there <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh that's helpful maybe we'll take one more question here there's one from david jackson about the work of ian mcgilchrist and um it, is there a kind of resonance um with the kind of mystagogical pedagogy here with um, a work of someone like McGilchrist and uh, the sort of re uh, integration of right right brain and left brain and the sort of maybe a more um, psychological uh, approaches that that also recognize a sort of deficiency in modern sort of empiricist ways of knowing um, with uh, a more patristic mindset. Um, well, I have to disappoint because I have not actually read Google Christ. So if um I mean if David wants to give us a really the bits that he was hearing resonances with that he'd like me to 
react to than I can. You're welcome to come out from behind the veil, David, if you'd like, but uh, if, if that's okay, if not. So, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, I, I, I was busy typing a reply, so I didn't hear. But basically, A. E. McGilchrist, The Matter of Things, 2013, well worth reading, in my view. I think he's onto something, uh, but I'm not a, a brain specialist. <laughs> uh, but I do think that... Um, or what should we say? There is an enormous need to return to the what I would call the mystic tradition of the church, and to and to redefine thinking. We need less thinking and more. Well, that's my shorthand way of putting it. Sorry about that, folks. Um, but less thinking disconnected from. I think what you're on about, which is that wide canvas, which is presented by the acceptance of mystery and the need for us to actually descend into some sort of silence regularly. <laughs> So there you go. I'll, if you want, I'll send the link. It's uh, it's easy to remember, though. The Matter with Things, Ian McGilchrist. It's two volumes and extreme, extremely expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, yeah, there, there's a, a lot of resonance, I think, both in, in what, um, what we've heard about. Um, Simon, I, I'm thinking particularly of the way that you picked up on this as a well, and Ephraim about the way that this offers uh, an engagement with contemporary culture and when what kind of healing that it offers. I think there's some really important things that Hannah does in terms of of the how and and the method, um, uh, and and what kind of resource mine is and what kind of of therapeia, uh it might offer. Um, there's some. There's some good bedside manner uh, in this in this kind of approach to healing uh, that, that I find really valuable. Um, uh, well, I want to bring our time to a close and just thank you again all for being a part of this rich discussion. Again, the book is Sensing the Sacred, Recovering a Mystagogical Vision of Knowledge and Salvation. Um, I put the code and the publisher's information in the chat. That's um, whipandstock.com, and you can find the book there. And the code, the 40% code again, is uh, catechesis. Um, and, and again, this is it's been put on by the Catechesis Institute. Um, and I hope you'll you'll keep up with us through through our newsletter uh, and and follow along with what we're doing. Uh, this is exactly the kind of, of thing that that we want to support. A really rich reflection on on theology that has. Uh, good important implications for uh, the life of the church. Uh, so thank you again for all being with us all to Simon and Ephraim for your comments. Thank you especially to Hannah uh, for the, the wonderful gifts uh, that you've given us in this book um, and the wonderful labors of love that have been uh, that gone on behind it. So thank you all so much. We'll bring our time to a close here.